turn in visitor slip at the Connect Corner in the lobby and receive a free gift bag. Update our prayer list by emailing your request to cfcprayerrequest1 at gmail.com or text 252-908-0100 and in person by simply filling out a prayer card and dropping it in the prayer box on the altar by Minister City. Please observe all handicapped reserved seating for those in need of special care. And please, no food or drink in the worship center. Bottle water only. Thanks. Please do not leave personal items or trash in the seats. All unauthorized items left in the seats will be placed in the lost and found bin behind the welcome desk at the Connect Corner. Your cooperation is deeply appreciated. And remember, at the Connect Corner, CSC swag like hats, shirts, visitor bags, CSC cups and decals, monthly event calendars, church directories, sermon CDs, and books can all be picked up there. You can also register for home life groups and more, so be sure to visit our Connect Corner. Please share all online broadcasts on our Facebook page. Check us out online at csc.sandycross.com for great features including online giving and more. Download our ShareFace app by picking up a copy of instructions for both Android and Apple at the Connect Corner on your way out today. Now, let's get ready to pray it in as we prepare to praise the roof off of this place. CFC, make some noise for Jesus! Hallelujah. He said, make some noise for Jesus. The roof ought to be gone. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. We come with an expectation. We're so glad you came to be with us on this morning. Are you excited about Jesus? I said, are you excited about Jesus? Hallelujah. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Lord. Great is your faithfulness, God. Great is your faithfulness. We thank you this morning, God. We come just to tell you thank you on this morning, God. And God, as we enter into your presence, God, we come with thanksgiving. We come with praise and we come with honor. You're such an awesome king, God. God, if we search the land, we'll find no other God like unto you, God. For truly you are the king of kings and the Lord of lords, God. We thank you for your redemption plan for all mankind, God. We thank you for sending your son Jesus, God, to die in our place, God. A debt that he didn't know, God. And a debt that we could not pay. But because of your loving kindness, God, you sent your son, God. And for that, we tell you thank you. Now, God, as we enter into your presence, God, we come asking, God, that you would anoint freedom afresh and anew this morning, God, as they open their mouths to sing the songs of Zion, God. Let your spirit reign in this place, God. For your word have declared, God, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that you are Lord to the glory of God, Lord. Counsel you have to bow. Every sickness and disease has to bow. And for that we tell you thank you. And God, as your man of God, come forth, God, with the word of life, God, in his mouth. God, we're asking that your Shekinah glory will fill this place, God. Come in like a mighty rushing wind, God. Make this atmosphere conducive now to miracle signs and wonders, God. We want to experience you in a whole new way, God. We set ourselves in alignment with your will for our lives, God. For truly we are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, God. We say have your way in this place, God. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Do what you would like, God. For we yield unto your spirit. For truly it's in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. And all the church said.
Got a little crowd here today, a little crowd here today, amen, but guess what, hallelujah, God's making some room for some things, hallelujah, hallelujah, God says keep building, keep growing, I'm going to fill every seat, I'm going to fill every heart, I'm going to fill every mind with my glory, amen. I know COVID's trying to rear its ugly head in our community again. 
and we're being very careful and everything. And all I can say is this, if you feel sick, get tested. If you're positive, miss two services. Two services, that's over a week. That's more than what they even tell you. They say five days. I say just miss two services and come on back. Amen? Amen. But we're going to keep going. It's too hot to get in the parking lot. I ain't doing it. <laughs> Can I get a witness from the sound room and the praise team on that? Amen. <laughs> but guess what? We are here today. We ought to have a big online audience today. I'm believing for it. Amen. Amen. So let's pray everybody online. I'll just wake up, get out the bed. Don't watch the recording. Watch it live. Amen. Hallelujah. Because God knows your heart. And if you really want to be here today and you can't because you're quarantining or whatever, guess what? The same miracle that can happen in person in this place can happen in their living room this morning. Hallelujah. Because they ain't being lazy. They ain't being slack. They're being careful. So I want everybody that's quarantining at home right now to be blessed in the name of Jesus. I want you to feel the Holy Ghost in your living room. Hallelujah. Praise God. And we're going to play uh, one of my favorite songs. We're playing all my favorite songs this morning. I got to plan to set this this month. <laughs> Hallelujah. Renee did it while I was gone. I'm getting ready to play some of my favorite songs. Rob, can you start off this song, if you will? He usually says, yes, I will. Same God that never failed will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late. It's working all things out. Working all things out. Come on. And yes, I will get you high. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days. Oh, yes, I
just say something? No Christian with respect and honor would ever say to God, no, I won't. Come on. But we say it with our life. We say it with our thinking. We say it with our reactions. And we say it with our choices. Amen. Amen. So know the depth of when you sing a song that says, yes, I will. Yes, you will what? All these things in here. Yes, I will. I'm not going to give up in these last days. Amen. I'm not going to fall away. Got a lot of reasons to. Got a lot of worldly reasons, a lot of flesh reasons to. Amen. But I'm not. I'm not. You can come to the brink, but don't. But if you do, come on, stay on that ledge. Fall, get back, get back away from the edge. The edge is too risky. We get there. We get to that point. But don't fall. If you're going to fall, fall down on your knees and cry out to him. Don't fall apart. Why, Daniel? Why? So we can be positive, happy people? No. Not just that. It's good to live that way. And you will. Sometimes you'll be like that. Sometimes you ain't going to be all that positive. Sometimes you're not going to be happy. Right? Because happiness is out here. But I cannot be happy and still have joy in my heart because that comes from God. Amen? Amen? And when your joy comes from God, you don't need man to make you happy. Amen? And so when we have a God like that that will bring us through anything, and with what I have gone through and my family has gone through in the last couple of months, I don't know what I'd do without the house of the Lord. I don't know what I'd do without other Christians. I don't do, know what I would do without fellowship. Amen? I don't know how people go through massive, tragic losses uh, without the Lord. I don't know how to do it. I, I don't want to do it. Amen? Your flesh may say you can do it, but uh, His way of coping is so much better than the world's. Amen? And so for that, a God like that, all I can say is He's worthy of everything we can give Him. Amen. And we'll never be able to give Him everything He's worthy of. Hallelujah. But come on, somebody. He's worthy. Amen. Are you ready to sing this morning? Hallelujah. Here we go. Let's worship the Lord this morning. It was my cross. It was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Is your name Jesus? You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. shame is gone I stand amazed in your love undeniable your grace your grace goes on and on and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Worthy is your name. 
do it because he's worthy. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. Come on, y'all. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name. Jesus, every hand, every hand right now, we got to pray as a family. 
in the mighty name of Jesus, we come against, we come against affliction. We come against diagnoses that have hit this home. In the mighty name of Jesus, I come against it. I come against it. I call out sickness and disease. I call out infirmity and say it's trespassing on this young home, on this young family. This shall not be. This shall not be. This shall not be. This shall not be. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe you. I receive you. Let this family, Lord God, trust you every step of the way. Every step of the way. No matter what it looks like. No matter what it feels like. Every step of the way. All the way through the process. No matter how painful it gets. Oh, let them trust you through the process. So they can hold on to the promise. God, we're believing right now. 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 Anoint her. Anoint her. God has called her. God has called her. God has said to you, my daughter, I have been waiting. I have been waiting for you to strip away everything that held you back. And all the darkness that the enemy tried to plague on your mind and said, you'll always be like this. But God said, no, I'm raising up a champion and not just a worshiper, not just a praiser, but a leader, a leader. Hallelujah. And so God continue to raise her up. Let her believe in herself because you believe in her. Let her know her validation comes from you. It comes from you. No weapon formed against her shall prosper. They will form. They can be intimidating, but they will not work. They will not work anymore. Leadership on this family's life. Leadership on this man's life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, you're raising him up. You're raising him up. You're raising him up. You're settling him in. You're settling him in. All the blockages have been pushed out of the way. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. The future right here, the future right here. In the name, anoint him, anoint him. Hallelujah. We come right now. Hallelujah. If this man's been a blessing to y'all, would you come and pray for him? Pray for your spiritual father right now. Do you know that? Do you know he's your pastor? And do you know how bad the devil hates pastors? Especially ones that's got a testimony. Especially ones that used to run with him and used to shout for him. And now they're shouting for the Lord. So we got to pray for him this morning. The enemy wants to destroy him. He wants to destroy his mind, his flesh, his home, his marriage, his children. The enemy has tried all of that. And he's still standing. He's still standing. And so now he wants to destroy his body. I say in the name of Jesus right now. Anything in this back that's not functioning, any slip disc, any torn vertebrae, any pinched nerve, I come against it in the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost, do surgery on this man right now. Do surgery on this man right now. Help him, Jesus. Help him, God. Help him, Jesus. We declare it. He declares it. No matter what, he's going to praise his way out of the pain. He's going to praise his way out of the pain. In the name of Jesus. Keep praying for him, gentlemen. Keep praying for him, gentlemen. Hold on, hold on. Pastor Tim, bring that anointing all of it here. Right here. Another miracle, right? Just like the Leap family needs a miracle, the Thomas family needs a miracle right now. I hope y'all ready to shout, jump, run, flip. Good God Almighty. Hallelujah. God is getting ready to tangibly heal right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. From the top of her head to the soles of her feet. We rebuke 
Parkinson's disease in the name of Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. Just start praising. Just start praising. Maybe you're not amazed yet. Maybe you got to wait for the testimony of man. It's all right. He'll back it up with that. He'll confirm it with that. He'll vouch for what he did in this place through that if that's what you need. Don't, don't, you're not alone. Thomas needed the same thing. He needed the same thing. Hallelujah. But I'm not, I didn't come to the church to doubt. I came to shout. Because God really is bringing healing to the leak home. He really has called the Pearsons to leadership. Come on. He really is healing. Reverend Chris Hall's back. And he really is healing and delivering Maria Thomas. It's done. It's finished. Somebody say it's finished. Sing all my hands. All my hands have made. I'm laying down.
you satisfy. Come on. You satisfy me. You satisfy me. Spirit fall. Open up heaven's door. You win.
Glad they didn't come to a concert this morning. <laughs> come on, somebody. The Bible says, study the show thyself approved. We have to do that with music and word. Whenever you're going to present something to God and for God, you got to be ready. But how many know in the midst of you being ready, God will add, God will change, God will redirect, and he will guide. It's our job to be prepared. And then once you get prepared, you have to let go. You have to let go of everything you studied, everything you planned, everything you practiced. Because that's where the breakthrough comes in. Hallelujah. I don't know what it would like to be like one day to have a clock on the wall telling me what kind of time I have. I have pastors and denominations in this community saying, you got, you got to get ready for two and three services. I don't know how to do that yet. If God wants that to happen, he's going to help me. He'll help me. You say, why do you do that? They do that these days so that everybody has a time they can come. If 8 o'clock is too early, then 10 o'clock. If 10 o'clock is too early, we make all these things so possible just for the presentation. Hallelujah. And it don't move, mean that God can't move in an hour. It don't mean that God can't move in an hour and a half and all of that. It don't mean all that. But I'm saying right now, you need to be thankful. We need to be thankful where we are right now. And if we're thankful for where we are now, God will take us to where he's destined us to be. And he'll show us how to do it. Not to make our name great, but to make his name great. Why? Why do we need all that? Why don't we just cut it down and make it simple and simple and simple? Because we have to reach a very unsimple culture. This ain't 1985. This ain't 1955. This ain't even, this ain't even 2005, y'all. It's harder to reach people today than it ever has been. It's harder to reach a lost Christian now in 2022. It's harder to reach a backslidden Christian now than it was when I got saved. 
I didn't have all the things that people have against them now. Right? Every seat that's empty in this place today isn't because of quarantine. It's not because of vacation. It's because of the time we're living in and there's a devil on the loose. He's not in hell locked up. He is with us. But I serve a God whose name is Emmanuel and He is also with us. They're both with us. They're both among us. Which one are we going to listen to? Which one are we going to listen to? I'm going to listen to the one who has always been there for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to the one that authored my birth, that knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb. I'm going to listen to the one that at eight years old, I prayed for a miracle and I said, God, bring my parents back together again. And he did it. He did it. I said, God, bring me and my little boy's mama back together. That was after four years. Bring me and my little boy's mama back together again. He did it after nine years. The devil didn't do nothing but beat me down all those times in the waiting process. You see, a lot of reasons people back up is because they get frustrated during the waiting process. And I believe that there's people right now, you're in the waiting process. You're in a, you're in a marriage right now that doesn't look like it's going to get a breakthrough. But can I tell you, the breakthrough's coming. The breakthrough's coming. You're not going to keep being by yourself all the time. Come on, somebody. Who our God ordains you to be with is going to be with you. So we got to pray right now. Father, I come right now. Every empty seat that is not represented by quarantine or vacation or work. God, we pray for those families. You may have released this pastor from many of them, but they're not released from you. And they're not released from this fellowship. These doors are open. They've been open. Hallelujah. But I do not validate anybody. You do. And so I say today, God, help the backslider. Help the downtrodden. Help the one that doesn't think they need you anymore. And they don't need your things anymore. They need you. They need this house. They need this word. They need this experience. They need this culture. They need this environment. God, we proclaim that today. It's been a hard year. It's been a, a weary season. But God, you got some people that's standing up today. I'm still here. I'll carry the torch. I'll carry the torch for my family until they catch up with me. We'll carry the torch for this church and this ministry until they catch up. And I hope they catch up. But God, we're moving forward. And we can't wait to see what you have in store for us along the way. We are excited about the greatest revival in the history of man. The time of Jubilee is upon us. You don't have to wait for an election to start praising. You praise Him in the valley now. Most Christians don't agree with a lot of the things that's going on in our culture and in our leadership. But you can't wait until that thing changes. You got to praise the Lord now. You praise Him right now over $5 gas and He will sustain you and He's going to get you through. Because you don't participate in man's economy. You participate in the kingdom. And you're going to get help from so many places. You don't have to go into a depression every Friday when you fill up your tank. Glorify Him. My God, it just cost me twice as much, but I glorify you, God. Come on, somebody. I glorify you, God. I need the work. I need the work. I need the work. You sacrifice Sunday morning. 
And God will give you more work than you can ever. <laughs> you better know I'm talking right. You take off about 4 or 5 o'clock on Wednesday and you come on out here and get your praise on. Watch what God does for you. Watch what he does for your business. Watch what he does for your livelihood. Come on, somebody. Have we forgotten about all those things? He's already done all these things. We have locked ourselves away from the blessings we have already had. And they didn't run out. We just ran away. Open yourself back up to receive what God has always given you. And He will give you even more. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place today. Thank you for the healing that took place today. Healing that was paid for over 2,000 years ago. And we still reap the benefit of now. Hallelujah. You say, how in the world do you do that? My grandfather paid off the land that I live on now many years ago. And I get the benefit of it now. Jesus went to a cross and he allowed them to beat him until his insides were exposed. And then he allowed them to stretch him out on a Roman crucifixion cross. And he took something that was deadly and worldly and evil. And now it's holy. You realize that? That cross that we look to, it was evil. It was deadly. Until Jesus laid on it. And then they killed a man that was capable of dying. But he came back. And anybody that's spiritually dying right now, can I tell you there's resurrection power in you? And you can raise back up. He paid for it over 2,000 years ago. We don't have to put him on the cross no more. We don't have to beg him. All you got to do is believe in what he has already done. And you simply have access to it. And you can reap the benefit of it. Now, I better save some preaching for later. Pastor Tim, what say you in this place filled with God's presence and miracles? You know, as I was standing listening to you minister, you know, the devil don't want us to say anything. But as I began to ponder what you were saying, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, what have you become satisfied with? What have you become satisfied with? See, there's so many things that gets our attention besides Him. And we can get so satisfied with everything else but Him. But we still find ourselves empty on the inside. Uh, I was listening to that song. It said, you are the only one who satisfies me. See, until we get to that place where only Jesus will satisfy us, good God Almighty, I'm talking right. I'm not talking about your house. I'm not talking about your cars. I'm not talking about your spouse. I'm not talking about your children. Oh. See, God said, if I don't hate all those things, good God, and follow him, our living is in vain. Huh? The scriptures say, seek ye first the kingdom. And all of these other things will be added. See, we're not serving God for stuff. Huh. If you're serving him for stuff, you don't miss it. We serve him because of he love. He loved you when nobody else would. Nobody. When everybody else judged us, condemned us. Come on.
But Jesus was still willing to pay a price for our lives. As raggedy as our life was, good God Almighty, uh, he still loved us. He still took care of us. In my worstest moment, Chris, I found out he loved me. Do y'all hear me? I said, in my worstest moment, his love for me never changed. See, we keep waiting for people to love us, for people to validate us. But can I tell you, it's in Jesus. If you were getting in his presence, uh, if you would just get in his presence, ah, uh, he'll turn everything around. He's already declared and all things work together for your good. Huh? Well, what about the storm? All things work together for your good. The storm is necessary. Uh, every storm that you face is necessary if it wasn't he wouldn't allow you to go through it uh, but we gotta know without a shadow of a doubt that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord that he is Lord that he is Lord God. My God. Please don't miss it. Don't miss what he has in store. Truly weeping may endure for a night, but your joy will come in the morning. Huh? He's waiting for worship. Good God. He's waiting for praise. He desires your worship. Uh, and your purest worship comes out of your brokenness. You being broken in his presence. Uh, I love shit. You talking about being flooded with healing. Uh, flooded with restoration. Uh, you talking about all things becoming new. Uh, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. You got to keep running. You got to keep pressing forward. No matter what we face, knowing that God is in charge. Am I right about it? Come on, ushers. Mm. Being confident of this very thing, that he who begins a good work, will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You can stand on that because that's the word. He said he will complete it. My God. Cast all your cares upon him. For he cared for you. You got to stand on the word. It'll change your whole life. I said the word will change your whole life. If we embrace it, come on, you got to embrace it. Take it for what it is. Stop letting the enemy move you out of your position in Christ. He said we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We keep trying to work it out for ourselves. When he don't fix it, I said he don't fix it. You trying to figure it out and he don't work it out. The Bible says he'll make a way out of no way. Good God. If he can cause his people to go on a journey through the wilderness, what can our God not do? Stay in carriage. We're here for one another. Stop trying to be a long ranger in this thing. Lean on your brothers and sisters. Lean
lean on your pastors. We're here to fight with you. We're for you and we're not against you. Stop letting the devil trick you to think everybody's against you. Everybody ain't against you. There's more for you than against you. And you got to know that. Deep in your spirit. Amen. Of course, you know, there's plenty of ways that you can give if you cannot attend. You can give on our website at clcsandacross.com. You also can give on our Share Faith app. Our download instructions for Apple and Android are on our website and on our Facebook page. And if you would like, you can give the old-fashioned way. You can mail in your donation to Christian Fellowship Church, 7814 South NC Highway 58, M City, North Carolina, 27822. Again, we'd like to thank you. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus. We say thank you, Jesus. We say thank you, Jesus, in the midst of the storm. Uh, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your goodness. And most of all, we thank you for your mercy. God, your mercy is new every day. And we thank you for it. And now, God, as we come to bring our gifts unto you, our prayer is that it will be acceptable in your sight, God. God, we pray right now, God, that it would be for the saving of every nation under heaven, God. That lost men and women and children may come to experience you in a real and a true way, God. That they would know of your salvation, God. That you've been given a name that's above every name. That at your name, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that you are Lord, God. God, our prayer is, God, as this money travels across each nation, God, it will be for the saving of souls, God. That it will change someone's direction, God. That they will experience you in a true and a real way, God. That they would know without a doubt that you are Lord to the glory of God. And we say do it for your glory, God. And God, as we pour into the kingdom, pour back into our lives, God, a hundredfold. For this is our prayer. And it's in the master's name of Jesus we pray. And all the saints of God say, you may give at this time.
Can we just bless the Lord in this place? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before we want to go any further, I just would like to acknowledge Pastor's mother, Sister Betty Parker. Come on. Can we give it up from this great woman of God? Hallelujah. We bless the Lord. We're not going to stand in the way. We're ready for the word. I know y'all are ready. Because we've been saturated in praise. So the ground is fertile. I believe some ground is going to grow today. Because he's truly have planted in our lives. Y'all ready for the man of God? I'm ready. This new series. Come on, give it up for our pastor, Pastor Daniel Parker. Praise the Lord. Guess what? I'm not tired yet. Hallelujah. Praise God. Somebody says sometimes, what are you back there so long for? I'm sitting in front of a fan. <laughs> Listening to what God says through Tim Hall. I'm still with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I don't want to be up here uncomfortable. I'm soaking wet. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know how to give it halfway. I know maybe I won't be always able to do ministry this way. Hallelujah. But then again, maybe I will. My pastor's 78 years old. He's not here today, uh, so I could tell y'all this. He's 78 years old. He done 30 push-ups in 22 seconds the other morning. I want to be like him when I grow up. And here, this makes me more John Wayne-like. He did it on the edge of the pond right before he got ready to get in the boat. Mm. You didn't see him down there doing that moment? He did it. He did it. Hallelujah. So y'all just, uh, you know, when he gets back, he don't want nobody to know about it because he's not trying to brag. Right? Because he doesn't want anybody else that might be 78 to feel like they need to be doing that. But that's my pastor. Amen? That's my pastor, and uh, I hope I can do this uh, as long and as effective as he's been able to do it. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, if you're a visitor this morning, turning your slip to the Connect Corner, uh, there's books out there you can pick up too. Last Sunday's uh, summer worship night gathering was just so incredibly awesome. I still can't get over it. I daydream about it. I get goosebumps bumps and everything thinking about it. It was like something, you know, you see these uh, Maverick City and all them on YouTube. It was like that. And uh, it was just beautiful. Everybody was singing. It sounded like that we had a choir singing with us. It was phenomenal. And uh, I'm going to get with my, my team and see if we can't possibly crank out one more before the fall. Possibly. Possibly. Amen. So we'll try that. Under a Big God VBS Circus begins this week. And I know it's come at a rough time when COVID's trying to rear its ugly head again. But guess what? We're going to give these kids in this community and in this church the best VBS they've ever had. And we love Joy, and she's phenomenal. And she, sometimes you might think she was born with four arms and four legs. But she wasn't, so she needs all the help she can get. Amen. So youth leaders, please help her out this week. This is the children's revival, and we need to sow into them so that when they get older, they won't depart from it. Amen. Don't, we don't ever want to live with regret that we didn't bring our kids to church enough. There's people right now living with that regret. They live with that regret. And so we know the enemy is going to attack people, especially who have children growing up in their homes. The devil don't want your children in church. He don't want them singing Jesus' music. He doesn't want them to make relationships with other little kids in church. He doesn't want that. But God does. So let's create a culture. Amen? Hallelujah. Not just for us, but for the kids. Hallelujah. Because a church that's growing is a church that's sowing into the next generation. Amen? I had a buddy that was in ministry. He pastored a church. The church had 40 people in it. Within six months, it had 80 people in it. Except most of those were kids. 
The elders of the church said, we're going to have to let you go. There's too many kids in this place. They're tearing the church all to pieces. And they fired him for growing too fast. And we, we look at that and say, well, that's their loss. Do you know how, that's not the only fallout that happened. What happened there? Well, the church still ends up growing. All the kids left. So all those kids aren't being ministered to. And that pastor backslid and said he'll never do it again. So the kingdom lost a man of God. Come on, somebody. All because of what people think. Hallelujah. If they scratch the wall, we got dry erase. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. We have got to make it about them. And I'm not getting on y'all because we're all about the kids. Amen. But that's, don't that still kind of make you a little bit, don't, I ain't going to say mad, but I'm saying like my grandma used to say, don't it make you ill? <laughs> Hallelujah. World wrong with them. Too many kids. Good God. Hallelujah. Thank God for children. Hallelujah. Guess what? Men's and Ladies Fellowship lunches resume next month. The ladies will have theirs on the second Sunday. The men will have theirs on the third Sunday. We're still trying to plan an activity for our men. Be patient with us. Uh, so many things have been up in the air because of our schedule, but uh, we're going to try to get the men together, go bowling, play cornhole, do something. We'll, we'll have that soon. But that is all I've got for right now. Was there another last-minute announcement that was sent that I didn't write down? Anything you know about? Anything we're good with? I know, uh, what, I know what it is, the backpack thing. What's that? Is that it? The backpack thing, and you, the kids' backpacks, where we pack backpacks for the kids, right, Joy? Wow. 20, that's on a Sunday. They just, all they got to do is show up, and they get a backpack full of stuff they need for school. Amen. Isn't our church awesome? <laughs> Amen. Isn't church awesome? Because it's not just our church. There's a lot of other churches that do that too, and that's a wonderful thing. I want to read something to you before we dismiss the King's Kids. It's great to know the world is full of such generous people like you. We would like to extend our deepest gratitude for the outpouring of food, calls, texts, visits, before, during, and after the passing of our mom, Patricia. We will always cherish and appreciate the unending kindness, love, and support shown to our family. It will be remembered always. Love, Hillary, Carol, and Macy. Amen. And Becky, too. Amen. Let me say this. Hillary, Carol, and Macy, if you're listening, I can't imagine doing this, what I've been through, without all these people here. And we're going to love everybody no matter what. But, man, you really want to feel the love? Get in here and be a part of some things that just went on right then. You'll feel the love then, won't you, Chris Hall? You'll feel the love then, won't you, Ginger Leek? You'll feel the love then, won't you, Maria Thomas? Come on, somebody. Amen. The church is always going to be here, and we're going to be here for everybody that we can be here for. That's what we do. You don't have to climb a ladder. You don't have to earn stars. This ain't a points contest. But at the end of the day, I cannot imagine losing my father and not having a church family. Good God Almighty. Come on, somebody. Nothing but love in the house. Nothing but good people here. Amen. Hallelujah. But guess what? We're all getting ready to go to the place that Patricia is already at, that my daddy is already at, that Renee's Aunt Debbie is already at. Been a lot of deaths lately. Um, that Dennis Hedgepeth is already at, come on somebody, it's hard, amen, but I'm so glad we're here, I'm so glad we're together, and I'm so glad we have each other, amen, I want to recognize also Jonathan Baker, I had a good conversation with your daddy the other day, Jonathan's dad had a remarkable transplant surgery, he had double lung transplant, and whoo, hallelujah, he told me, he said, I've been given a chance that a lot of people don't get. He said, I'm going to do something with it. And Haywood said he'd be watching this morning. He said, Haywood, we're here. We're ready, brother. Hallelujah. He had to move close to the hospital. He's, he has to be within 30 minutes of Duke right now. But there'll be a time when that's not the case. And he says he's ready to get on back to good old Nash County. He had to sell his house. He had to do all kinds of things to fight for his life. 
so he can move up there and go through this. And he's there still. He says, but when I get out and I move back around there, I'm coming to CFC, and I want to serve the Lord there. Amen. He, I didn't call him. He called me and told me that. And you're talking about a great guy, great guy, a plumber his whole life, who's done some work for me in my house, just a wonderful man, great heart, great family, and I'm just so glad of what God is doing for him. Amen? Amen. Double lungs. He's got two new lungs in his body, and his body is receiving it, not rejecting it. So we thank God for that. Amen? Amen. And so we look forward to seeing him uh, when he's able to get back in this area. Hallelujah. All right. At this time, if there's nobody else, nothing else, King's Kids, Junior King's Kids can be dismissed at this time. And we want to thank our leaders. Can you thank them? A little bit. It's summertime. We got people watching from the beach today. Bless your heart. Hallelujah. If you got your toes in the sand and you got your phone in your hand, <laughs> praise God, you're getting ready to get blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. I thank God for online ministry. Amen. Had it not been for online ministry, many of those that have left to go be with the Lord would not have been able to be uh, a part or even see or hear the Word of God in their last days. And guess what? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Amen? And we have to have our faith built, especially at the end of our life, right? So thank God for that. Amen? Did they put the new CFC cross on here? Look at that thing. Isn't that pretty? I want to thank Daniel Pearson's mama for making that. Hallelujah. Tim's getting worried, boy. He's getting worried. Hallelujah. That, that's an awesome looking cross. I'll be ever be forever grateful to Brother Josh Siler for uh, designing that beautiful, beautiful cross. Amen. You see this cross, man, you know it's the cross of Jesus Christ, but it represents this place. Amen. And we're so thankful for that. All right, we got a new series. Validation. Somebody shout it validation we're coming out of learning about having a double mind and now we're going to learn about something that is so important it is the root cause of so many people's depression anxiety it's the root cause of so many people's lack of confidence and lack of self-esteem if those things have ever plagued you or are plaguing you right now as you are sitting here or watching online, we're getting ready to learn everything God wants to tell us about this. And then when we're done, we'll do something else, okay? And I think it's going to be called targeted prayers. Not sure yet. But I know we're supposed to do this right now. I don't know if it'll be past this month. We're going to just kind of find, kind of see but when it comes to validation, we'll better know our identity and our purpose when we know who validates us. To validate means to confirm validity. It also means to vouch for what's proven. Children may long for validation from parents, coaches, and mentors. I am here to tell you, I... The first person that ever validated me was my mama, right? If she told me I was good at it, guess what? I believed I was good at it. If she told me I could do it, I believed I could do it. And whether anybody else ever thought I was pretty or not, my mama told me I was. Amen? Parents, coaches, mentors... That need and desire follows people throughout life, right? You never stop that. You never stop desiring validation until God. And there's many, you mean we just need to get a relationship with Jesus Christ and then we won't be uh, needing validation anymore? No, 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 no. It won't break you when you don't get it from everybody else, though. Amen. When we're born again, we begin to see who really validates us. 
and all he's done to prove how solid his validation truly is. Being a child of God should be our chief sense of validation. Hallelujah. We'll say amen to that because we believe that and we know that. But how many know that sometimes it's hard to put into practice the things we believe? It's hard sometimes to implement what we know, right? And so we're going to learn about some things. Because it's hard sometimes when your soul is joined to someone else. But you feel as though they have not validated you. Well, guess what? God is tired of seeing people stand this way because you're reliant on a spouse. Because you're 55 or 60 years old and you're still reliant on what your daddy didn't give you when you were young and what he didn't say. I've had grown men 50 years old saying, I love my dad, I know he loves me, but he's never told me, never, ever told me. I don't know how that is because I had a father that told me he loved me. But it breaks my heart for that person whose daddy never told them that they love them. You say, well, actions speak louder than words. Yes, they do, and love is an expression. But if you don't ever think those three words need to come out of your mouth to a child, right? Little children need to hear that. And we'll be surprised at how a child will act, think, and reason when they get to be an adult simply because of the things they didn't hear when they were a kid. Dads, I don't care how proud you are. I don't care how tough you want to make that son. Tell him you love him. I don't care how tough you want that daughter to be. She might be the best softball player on the field, the best volleyball player on the court. I don't care how tough you want her to be. Tell her you love her. Amen? Don't go around in a marriage thinking, well, they know. They got a hot meal on the table, don't they? They ought to know. I'm still here, ain't I? Tell them you love them. Can I get an amen? Father, help us as we help ourselves and one another in this deep, provoking subject. Help us to grow. Help us to heal. Help us to be made whole because of the scriptures you bring out over the next few weeks. God, if we miss a single service, let us catch up online and go on this journey together as we all learn about this incredible subject called validation. In the mighty name of Jesus, and God's people said amen three times. Then you gave him a big shout of praise because he alone is worthy. Are we ready? Are we ready? All right, I'm just checking. First Samuel chapter 30. First Samuel chapter 30 will be in verse 1. We will be in verse 1. Oh, man. And guys, I had another scripture I added at the end. Are we good with that? Good, 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 good. Y'all know in the Old Testament I love to preach on Joseph and David. We're going to look at David's life again. Probably going to look at it again Wednesday. We'll look at some other people too, but I love to talk about David. My first and only focus point is this. Nowhere to turn but the only place to turn. Reminds me of when Simon Peter said, where else can we go? For only you have the words of eternal life. Have you ever felt like, my goodness, I have nobody I can turn to. I can't take this to the pastor. I can't take this to sister so-and-so. I can't take this to brother so-and-so. I can't even talk to my spouse about it. I, I, I don't know what in the world. I don't know where to turn. Now look at all those outlets I just went through. And no Christian has yet 
that, that's the way a lot of Christians think. That's the way a lot of preachers think. What about God? Is God some character that we promote? Or is he real or not? What if I went to him first? What if I went to God before I went to my pastor? What if I went to God before I went to my spouse or my best friend or confidant? I have seen people before say, Pastor, I was going to call you the other night. But guess what I did? I prayed. And God brought me through it. And I'm delivered. And I'm here today to just praise the Lord. I'm like, thank you. Now, that don't mean you can't call me. But it does mean that somebody said, wait a minute. I'm not validated by the man behind the pulpit. I'm validated by the one who's inside the man. Right? Amen. Come on, somebody. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, and many, many pastors that are retired and aging will, will tell you now, I wish I'd have done ministry the way it's being done now. Because the old way wore me out. I, come on, somebody. I, I was here. I was there. I had to be every, I had to be coach. I had to be mentor. I had to be sheriff. I had to be referee. I had to be psychiatrist. All those things. Wait a minute. I've not read in my Bible that a man of God or a woman of God is supposed to do all that. Only role I've ever seen is equipper. I equip you. They equip you. And then we go out and we implement what we've been equipped with. Wait a minute. Greater is he that's in me, not just the pastor. Right? In this particular portion of Scripture, it's during a tumultuous time in Israel's history. Here's where it's at. Saul, King Saul is Israel's first official king, right? Oh, we'll get into that. We're going to talk about their need for that human king or that man king on earth. And is nearing the end of his reign while preparing to battle the Philistines. Saul is at the end of his reign. He's, to, he's been wanting to kill David because David was more popular than he was. And he wanted to kill him for it. And he probably should have never been king in the first place. But when people try to push the will of God... Many times you'll get things you don't really need. When you try to make God's will happen, you're going to make a mess. You see, he had been at odds with David, so David had formed his own army and had found favor with another ruler named Achish who had given David and his men and all their families a small town to live in called Ziglag. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a psalmist already. He was a worshiper already. He had done slain a, a, a nine-foot pagan giant that was blaspheming God. And because he outdid the leader, the leader hates him. And the leader had him on the run. And David had to run from someone who was supposed to be a spiritual father. Do you know how heartbroken I would be? If I made Pastor Jerry so mad, he was hunting me down. <laughs> oh, that's Jerry. I love you, Pastor Jerry. Please don't hurt me. Can you imagine the conflict? The one I honor hates me. The one I honor and uphold and learn from, he despises me. So maybe David was in his flesh a little bit, but come on, David didn't have a whole lot of recourse there. He had to leave his home. He had to leave his territory, and he had to go into enemy territory to hide. Can you imagine not even being safe at home? Not even being able to be comfortable at home. So he went into enemy territory, and they thought, oh, man, we have got the champion of Israel. We have got Israel's greatest warrior since Samson. Come on, somebody. That's who he was. I know a lot of people look at Samson as a superhero. You better know that David was one bad dude. Saul ordered him one time. 
to bring him, what was it, 300 foreskins of Philistines? Amen. He came back the next day with a bag full of them. What else you need? Somebody did that. I'd be like, oh, I am always going to love you. I'm going to be like Whitney Houston singing, oh, I will always love you. No. It offended him because he was able to go and do such great things. It, 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 it offended him that he was mighty. Can I tell you, you are never going to offend me if you get powerful. When, come on. When you get so powerful, I'm not going to hold you. I'm not going to hold you. Good God Almighty. Never done that. Oh, God's called you to preach. Hallelujah. Go. God's called you to pastor. Go. Hallelujah. Never going to hold you back. Saul wanted to hold David back. David went and found favor with King Achish. Now, King Achish was a Philistine. Philistines were the enemies of Israel, right? David had killed many of them before Saul got mad, right? So King Achish sends David and his men back home instead of allowing them to go with them to Jezreel to fight King Saul. This this will preach by itself. They were on their way to fight David's people. And David was so offended by the fact that he wasn't welcome by Saul or the Israelite army anymore because of Saul. He was willing to go fight with the Philistines. How many know that God will protect you from your own plans? What do I mean? He goes to Achish. Akish loves him to death. Akish feels that favor and that anointing from having David the same way Potiphar felt it from having Joseph in his house, right? But then his men say, listen, we've battled other people. We've battled the Amalekites. We've battled the Amorites. We've battled them. David's been with us. But we are fixing to go battle his homeland. We ain't trusting him with that. What if? What if he, he might turn on us and start killing us from within to help Israel win? They, didn't tr- they were trying to trust David, but they said, well, we ain't going to trust you against your own people. And we don't know David's heart. But God knew, no, I'm not going to let you go that far. You got a reason to be mad, son. You got a reason to be disappointed. You got a reason to be frustrated. You got a reason for things to feel unfair, but I can't let you go that far. Good God, somebody needs to receive that this morning. I know you're mad sometimes. I know you're frustrated. I, good God, play that organ. I know, hallelujah, you feel like some unfair things have happened and you should not be in the place you're in, but God says, hold up. I ain't gonna let you go that far. Hallelujah. Amen. Not going to let you go that far. And so he didn't. Guess what Akish did? Reluctantly, he has to go to David. All right, I'll be Akish. Rob's going to be David. All right, ready? David, awesome as you are, as much as I love you, you can't go with us on this one. I'm going to have to send you back to the little, little, sweet little small town I set aside for you. You go back there and rest. You don't have to fight. David was a fighting man. He was ready to fight. That's what he did. Hallelujah. He fought for God's glory. Now he would be fighting for the wrong reasons had he been allowed to fight, right? He would have been allowed to fight in his flesh. God is not going to let a spirit-filled man or woman of God go out in battles that they don't need to be fighting. So... David and the Bible would call them his mighty men, right? He'd go back and say, all right, guys, they don't need us on this one. And I think there must have been a sigh of relief in there. That even though David and all those men were mad because Saul and Israel's army had turned their back on them and didn't want them, they didn't want to fight them. They didn't. But perhaps they thought they had to have some kind of allegiance towards Achish. Because he had blessed him with a home. His spiritual father took his home away. This pagan man who has no covenant with Jehovah God 
I'll give you a home. Right? Come on, somebody. No matter how bad they hurt you, no matter how bad they offended you, don't make other Christians have to go be comfortable in the world because they're not comfortable with you. Right? So with that said, he tells the guys we got to go back home. We got to go back home to our wives and our children in the small town that Akish has given to us. Now watch this, verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag. Somebody they'd fought before had slid in while they were gone. While they weren't occupying the territory, the enemy slid in and attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever cried to the point you couldn't cry anymore? Have you ever cried so many times and so many days that it got to the point, you know what, I cannot keep crying like this. They felt that way, not over a period of time, but right then. They cried so hard because suddenly and immediately, Everything they were returning to that gave them comfort and peace was gone. We didn't fight against Israel. The Philistines don't want us. The Israelites don't want us. We came back to our home, and now our wives and our children are gone. And how many men know in this place, your wife, and your children, they're your life. They're your life. It's all right sometimes to feel like you can't make it without them. Why? You share a soul with them. Right? They're not just acquaintances. They're not just good friends. They're a part of your life. You and your wife came together and created another life. That is powerful. And that's, come on somebody, that's why when people, even though they might split up and divorce, they will always have a connection. Always have a connection. It's a powerful connection. And it gave them comfort to know, well, we're not going to have to fight. Saul still hates us. The Philistines don't trust us. But at least we can go home and we can sit this one out and let them fight it out. And we can go and be with our wives and children. And they get there and they're gone. The devil snuck in the back door and took everything while they weren't looking. Have you ever had that happen to you? It's devastating, isn't it? Imagine these brave, mighty men coming home, longing to see their families and relax in their homes only to find their wives and kids gone and their homes burned to the ground. Guess what happens? After initial shock and tears comes blame. After you've cried about it, after you've wept about it, another part of grieving is anger. You want to blame somebody. Even David's family now had been taken captive along with the others. Skip down to verse 6. Guess who these men are going to blame? It says in verse 6, now David was greatly distressed. His family was gone too. His house had been burnt to the ground too. But David was the leader of these men. And sometimes it's hard. I saw a thing about pastoring the other day. It says pastors have to pray for people for their problem to get solved. While the pastor has got a problem of his own that hasn't been solved yet. 
right? Let me pray for you because you lost your wife and your children and your home while mine are gone too and mine's behind me burnt to the ground. Right? That's the unfairness sometimes of leadership. We don't just have the burdens of what's going on with us. we got to help people with their burdens too. It says, now David was greatly distressed, right? Not just because his house was burnt down. Not just because the kids told him to go home. Not just because Saul wants to kill him. Not just because his wife and children are gone. He was greatly distressed on top of all of that now. Because the men who were with him, the people, spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of the people was great, grieved every man for his sons and daughters. What do you do after following someone to total destruction? You see, the enemy was coming in the spirits and the minds of those men saying, look at what following David has done for you. You followed him. You haven't followed him to greatness. You have fallen, followed him to destruction. You don't have anything anymore. You gave up everything to follow David. You gave up. Listen, most of these men had been soldiers for Saul. You gave up the official king who lives in the palace to the one who said, God said he would be king one day. And look what you followed him to. You followed him to a mess. And now you don't have nothing because of him. They wanted to kill David. But what did David do? It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You say, well, he had to. He didn't have nobody else to turn to. He didn't try. What do you mean? Nowhere here does it say that David, you ever seen, uh, they said Ric Flair just retired from wrestling. Bless his heart. I thought he retired 10 years ago. But one of the things that Ric Flair would do is over the top. He'd flip over the ropes. He'd walk down the, the apron of the ring. But another thing that he would do, he was always in wrestling what you call a heel. That means a bad guy. He would get down like this on his knees to the good guy. He said, no, please, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me like that. Now, Ric Flair would do that as a part of his character, Right? Because after he would beg them, one of the four horsemen would come in and kick the guy. Come on. And then Rick would get up off his knees and they'd all beat him up together. It was a ploy, right? David didn't act like that. You see, David wanted a nature boy. He was God's boy. And so when Dave, David didn't ever look at them and say, oh, y'all don't like me no more. Oh, y'all going to stop. Please don't put, no, put that rock down. Put that rock down. You don't really mean it. No. Instead of doing that, he went straight to God. What's next, Lord? You led me to this, so I led them to this. Is this it? All I see is destruction. All I see is fire. All I see is burnt down wooden homes. All I see is no kids, no wives, nothing. Hallelujah. You're fired up over there, aren't you, brother? Hallelujah. I'll catch up with you in a moment. I got to catch my preaching breath. I'm try to settle back down. He fires me back up. Hallelujah. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get fired up here in a minute. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David knew it wasn't his fault because he was validated by God. David didn't have a whole lot of things figured out yet. David would go on to make massive mistakes in his flesh. But the one thing David had down pat in this tumultuous season was he knew from where his help came from. And so when his earthly help felt like they wanted to give up on him, when his earthly help didn't care for him to lead him no more, when his earthly help and the people he had been blessed with didn't trust him to lead them anymore, and were so mad at him that they wanted to kill him and end him. David didn't beg for his life. 
David cried out to God. David knew that he could strengthen himself in the Lord his God. Give me shouting point number one. Watch this. While everyone else is busy turning on each other, I'll be busy turning to God. Play the blame game all you want to. Blame me all you want to. Come on, somebody. Bl bl blame ideas. Blame vision. Blame anything you want to. But while you're busy blaming me, while you're busy blaming each other, while you're busy blaming your spouse or, or something your parents didn't give you decades ago, I'm going to be turning to God. Because the blame game don't do, do nothing. You never win the blame game. Nobody ever wins the blame game. Turn to Him. And by doing that, you show that you understand validation. David didn't need any of those 600 men to like him. He just needed them to trust the fact he heard from God. Hallelujah. I love you. I love you. And I hope you love me. But I pastored this church in many a years. And not everybody that's ever sat in here liked me. How do you know? They told me. <laughs> they were honest. I don't like you. I don't like nothing about you. <laughs> I only came here because the wife wanted to come here. All right. Amen. People would fall away from the ministry and quit coming. After they were so fired up, man, it whooped me so bad. I'd be like, oh, they don't like us no more. I thought we were like, I thought we were boys, man. I thought they'd always be with me. Sunday after Sunday, they ain't here. Wednesday after, they gave up a long time ago on Wednesday. And I took that stuff to heart, and it plagued me as a person. And I finally woke up one day and said, you know what? I got enough going on. I, I've got a family to take care of. God Almighty. I, I, got, I cannot, to whosoever will, show up and let's do it. The table has been set. If you don't want to come to the table, it's not because I didn't set it. Amen? But I no longer can let anybody, any brother, any sister, come on, any church member, any tither, any worshiper, any leader in a church validate me my help comes from the Lord am I talking right amen so he strengthened himself in the Lord as God and listen what he did and I love this I'm going to pretend like this is is there any uh, prayer aprons in that box there is? Okay, I want to get them from there because that's supposed to be a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. And it would just seem more holy to grab them from here than over there. <laughs> I did not know about that. Can we get some Gorilla Glue on that? All right. That stuff will hold anything. <laughs> I didn't know it was broke. Father, forgive us for breaking your Ark of the Covenant, Lord. Find somebody didn't die trying to. Hallelujah. Did I do it? Oh. He said he didn't do it. All right. Priests wore something back in Jewish times called an ephod. It was an apron. They wore it on themselves. And they would even put uh, the amount of stones that were tribes of Israel and whatnot. There was all kinds of colors. It was kind of a, a spiritual garment. David, not only did he encourage himself in God and began to talk to God right then, but how many know that as soon as you talk to God in prayer, he doesn't always talk right back. He'll put an image in your head sometime. A while ago, God didn't say, go pray for this person, that person, or that person. God said, you already know the needs. You already know what's going on. I'm moving right now. Let's call out some stuff. That's what I felt led to do. Let's call out these sicknesses, these afflictions, these, all these different things, right? And so I acted upon it. David 
he strengthened himself in the Lord, meaning he was praying. And the first thing he thought to do was go to the priest and said, bring me the ephod. Bring me the priestly apron here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. It doesn't say that Abiathar was wearing the ephod and took it off. It said he brought it to him. So the priest didn't have it on. Do you remember when David was transporting the Ark of the Covenant later on? And he had a man that touched it when it was about to fall. That man died because of that. David was having it carried wrong because none of those four men were priests, right? David was able to have this and use this because God saw him as a priest. The Bible even says, I am a priest of my home. I think that day, had Uzzah left it alone and David had touched it, I don't think he'd have died. Because God allowed David to have the role of a priest, psalmist, worshiper, a soldier, and a king. God anointed him with a lot of hats to wear. Some people, he just anoints them with one, maybe two things. Some people are anointed for four and five things, right? And they do those things well. David gets the priestly apron, inquires to God. Something between verse 7 and verse 8, and verse eight right here happened. What happened? I believe as soon as David grabbed that ephod, he had already been praying. He had already not been bowing down to the men, right? David needed more than just strength. Uh, he needed an answer, Right? God will strengthen you through the process, but he will bring you an answer. Don't give up before you get the answer. Now watch this. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And verse 8 says, So David inquired of the Lord. After he's done turned to God and turned away from the people. After he's done asked the priest for a holy garment. And he says this. Shall I pursue this troop? They knew someone had come. and took. Perhaps they didn't know it was the Amalekites yet. They would find out later on it was. Shall I pursue this troop? In other words, I felt this. God, can I lead this? Am I still cut out to be a leader? Can I lead people that hate me right now? Can I lead people who want to kill me right now, can I lead people who don't really like me right now? And if I do, will I win? Shall I overtake them? And God answered him and said, pursue. Pursue. You shall surely Overtake them and without fail recover all. Now that's a bonus right there. That is a bonus right there. Come on. Not only should you go after it, but when you get there, not only are you going to win, you're going to win big and you're going to go right into the enemy's camp and take back what is stole from you. Good God Almighty. He learned right then. I, amen. God, what do you want me to do? They're ready to kill me. They don't like me no more, God. They don't want to hear nothing else I got to say, God. What do I do, God? Here's the thing. You say, well, what in the world made them get on board? When you've been in the presence of God, when you've heard from God, God's presence will glorify you in a way that you'll get in front of mad people and they still won't be able to deny you. You'll get in front of offended people. You'll get in front of frustrated people. You'll get in front of people. Hallelujah. You say, my God, I don't like this preacher, but I got to sit here and listen to what he's got to say. I don't like this guy. I don't like preachers that wear high tops on Sunday. There's something worldly about that. Can I tell you, my feet hurt, and these make my feet feel good.
I used to care about that because I used to have people to come up to me and says, you don't dress like a preacher. You need to have more honor for the house of God. Really? I'm sorry. And I would go and put on my religious suit. Not for me. Not because it felt like a suit kind of day. Because man told me, I want good enough. I want valid enough. And I want worthy enough to ever prosper as a preacher unless I dress like one and look like one and talk like one. I said, well, that might be for the man that came from here and the man that came from there. But can I tell you right now, I want to relate to everybody. I want the man who might not have a dollar in his pocket and he can't afford to go to a men's warehouse and buy a $300 suit. He can't afford to go to Joseph A. Bank and buy a $800 suit. Right? No more of people going to come in here and say, I'm not dressed good enough to go to church, therefore I don't belong. And for decades people felt that way. But I serve a God that said Jesus went to the cross. Grace covers you. Come as you are. The greatest preacher that ever lived was a man named John the Baptist, and he looked like a homeless man. He didn't have good hygiene. He ate bugs. And the bugs would get caught all up in his beard. And he wore animal skin. He looked like a caveman. But Jesus said, that's the goat right there. Greatest of all time right there. Hallelujah. That's what we need. We need a bunch of John the Baptists preaching today. Not worried about what they look like. Come on, somebody. But are just making a way. Make way for the God. Amen. John the Baptist was the beginning of the gospel. Could have been Jesus. But Jesus said, no. I'm going to let a great preacher go first. Because when I'm gone, there's going to be great preachers everywhere. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'm going to work through them. I didn't mean to preach so hard. I got happy. Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And God said, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. And without fail, you'll recover everything. Really, God? I'll recover everything. I'll be able to rebuild my home in record time because I'm not having to fight in the war. God will give you a vacation. I'm going to go into the enemy's camp, and I'm going to get... All my wives, all, all the wives and children, right? All my wives. Lord, forgive me. <laughs> he really had that going on, but we won't get into that. <laughs> David didn't just have to go get one wife. He had to go get both of them. Yeah. We won't even get into that. <laughs> Hallelujah. But with that said, he said, you're going to recover everything. Amen. I mean, if David didn't do no bargaining, he just said, well, look, can they just keep one of the wives and I bring the other one? You're going to get both of them back, and you're going to have to handle it because you put yourself in that situation. Amen. Come on, David won't perfect, y'all. He was a polygamist. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. Amen. But the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. Have you learned how good grace is yet? Hallelujah. Watch this. He told him, pursue. And if you'll pursue, if you'll go after, you'll get every single thing back. Give me that second shouting point. When we pursue God, he will help us pursue what we've lost and even what we've yet to attain. There are things that you will not attain, that you will not acquire, Unless you allow God to tell you to go get it. If you try to go get it yourself and God's not ordained it, good God, it is not going to happen. I had a minister tell me the other day, he said, I've got a guy trying to raise up. The guy's been saved for many years. He wants to be a pastor. He's tried to start up a church. It never works. He wants to do this. He wants to do that. Doors keep getting closed in his face. All these things keep happening. But the guy's very successful, he's very wealthy, owns businesses, and he operates his business like, like a kingdom man. And this man's out trying to attain this, attain that. Well, guess what? 
unless God told him to go and pursue that. It's not going to happen. Hallelujah. Can I tell you, when God called me to preach, I didn't get a door shut in my face. I didn't. And I didn't want to go through the door. I want ready to go through the door. I want equipped. I want educated. I didn't feel anointed. But the door was wide open. Right? When they voted, I got it by 11 votes. Laid here in an altar like I was on trial. We're never going to do that again. Amen. <laughs> the courts are in heaven. They ain't going to be in church anymore. Remember that mama? Remember that honey back there? Waiting for man's judgment. Are you good enough? Do they like you enough? Well, 11 more liked you than the ones that didn't like you. And you knew who they were because when they left, they said, congratulations. He voted no. <laughs> then the one that voted yes, good time. She voted yes. She didn't. She is fake. <laughs> Hallelujah. When God says pursue, he'll help you pursue what we've lost and even what we've yet to attain. Back to that businessman. He told him, he said, listen, have you ever thought that God's called you to what exactly you're doing right now? You're already in it. You're a Christian businessman. You operate your business like a Christian. You sow into the ministry. You raise up young people. You give people jobs, amen, and you love on them. And you, you even take them under your wing and say, listen, I'm not trying to push my religion on you. But when I pay you, you need to be paying tithes somewhere so you can get kingdom benefits like I've got on this company. He said, that is your pulpit. Every pulpit don't look like this. Sometimes your pulpit is down here. While ago, I prayed a lot, but I prayed while ago. I don't always do that because I see equipped people down here in their pulpit. Once in a while, I'll hand chuck the guitar and get out there with you. But I got people functioning in their pulpit. Your pulpit might be a, a street corner. Your pulpit might be, hey, I'll preach some here. But I'm also got to run a place called Redemption Place. Hallelujah. To help people. You'll preach a little bit here, but maybe you need to go build a ramp too. We see things and we say, I want to do like that. I even had a kid tell me one time, how do you get into what you're doing? I'd like to do it. It's pretty cool. This was never my idea. Never my idea. Hallelujah. But I tell you what, the days of struggling through it and giving in to the judgment of man and whether or not people like me anymore does not control this preacher anymore. I have been set free. All right. He will help you pursue everything you've lost and everything you've yet to attain. Anybody getting out of, anything out of this? I'm about done. That's all the scripture I'm going to read. Well, from that. You see, David sought God for the much-needed answer in that moment. Had it not been for David's unprecedented, tangible relationship with the Lord, he could have surely fallen so low under the pressure, hostility, and intimidation from all the blame of his own men who had supported him in the past. If it weren't for his solid and incredibly steadfast walk with God, he would have caved in to the fear of losing his supporters. Mm. Hallelujah. If I can't correct you because I'm scared of losing you, then my God, somebody correct me. But he didn't. He didn't cower down. He didn't cave in. Because he did, he didn't because he knew his help, he knew his strength, he knew his encouragement, he knew his guidance, and he knew his restoration all came from the Lord. In other words, he knew he was validated by God to lead those men, not by any 
other means. David turned to God when they turned on him. And I got to tell you this morning, when they turn on you, turn to God. You turn to God. And if they're still meant to be in your life, come on, somebody. And you turn to God, God will turn to them. And you'll see a different person within about 24 to 48 hours. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have treated you like that. Amen? Come on, somebody. David turned to God when they turned on him. Will you begin to turn to him instead of being turned upside down because of what people think about you? Give me my last shouting point and I'm done. I'd rather fall down on my knees seeking God than fall apart fearing people. Amen? I had rather fall down on my knees crying out to God rather than falling apart because somebody don't like me, somebody's going to leave me, somebody don't believe in me anymore, somebody's not interested anymore. I can't. I can't. Hallelujah. I got to turn to him. David went through things like that early on. Then he became a king and he had a whole new set of problems. But he was a psalmist who knew he was validated by God. He was a warrior validated by God. Come on, somebody. He, he would be a shepherd who was validated by God. He was a priest who was validated by God. And he would be a king who was validated by God. That's why he was really able to write, in my opinion, some of the most powerful psalms. I know Moses wrote some. A man uh, named Asaph wrote many. But the ones from David get me. They get me. I added this this morning. The Holy Spirit laid this on me last night to add this. Psalm 37. Verse 23 through 25. Psalm 37. David wrote this. He said, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Right? Yes. Not by other people. Not by other situations. But they're ordered by the Lord. And it says, and he being God delights in his way. Though he fall. Good God, I need to say that again. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord, for the Lord, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Amen. Watch this. David said, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Hallelujah. At the time of this, David had aged some. And he's saying, I've been through a lot when I was younger. I'm going through things as I'm older. But God raises me up. God delights in my ways. If I fall, God's still got my back. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. Amen? No matter how abandoned the enemy tries to make you feel. No matter how abandoned people try to make you feel. Can I tell you, hallelujah, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. So don't go around with your saved self talking about you've been forgot about and talking about you've been forsaken and you've been abandoned and you've been left behind. Oh, man treated you that way? Man is capable of treating you that way, but your God will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible says he'll go with you always, even until the end of the world. Ah, close. David showed all who were ready to blame and kill him exactly where his validation came from. And it restored not only David, but them too. Isn't it something? Don't you know they kind of walked away and said, oh, my God. We got everything back. Every wife, no matter how many, this one might have had and that one. We got them all. Every child. And we're on vacation so we can rebuild our home. We should have never doubted David. But what happened in that moment? What, what made them go from wanting to kill him to follow him? He'd been in the presence of God. Listen, guys, I know you don't trust me. I know y'all hating on me. You got rocks in your hands. You're ready to throw them. You're ready to crack my temple. 
with that rock you got in your hand. But maybe he said something like this, and I'm paraphrasing. Would you trust me one more time that I've heard from God? And that not only, we're not going to get revenge. We're going to get restoration. We're not going to get revenge. We're going to recover. We're going, and listen, they all got on board. Because I think they saw something, Brother Kevin, in David at that moment. I said, wait a minute. Now that's the David I said yes to. Hallelujah. Perhaps you were seeing something in me over the course of the last year. I hope you're starting to see that the pastor that once inspired you is on his way back. You know why? Because I've been with the Lord. And maybe some say, well, I can't sit under a man who's battled with depression. I can't sit under a man who, who, who's crying and grieving. I want to feel good. I want to feel happy. So I'm going to go see the happy pastor. Will you go ahead? But I hope you'll care more about him when he's going through hell on earth than you did about me. You've got a chance in this life to prove who you really are. But sometimes... You prove who you're not. I've been with the Lord. I'm not getting weaker, y'all. I'm getting stronger. It's the only way I want to live. My heart has been broke. I miss my daddy. But my God, he raised me up to be strong. Not to lay down and give up. He never gave up. Why in the world would I give up? So guess what? We'll take the crowd we got and we're going to go into the future and we're going to get more people saved and we're going to get them ready for the return of Jesus Christ that is happening very, very soon. I'm not a prophet, so I can't even tell you the year, but I got a year in mind. And when God releases me to say that year, I will, but until He does, I will not. But what I feel in my spirit is soon. Soon. Somebody say soon. Don't fall away now. When he shows back up, hallelujah, be where you're supposed to be. Hallelujah. Good God Almighty, if he shows up at 10.05, 10.30 on a Sunday morning, many people believe the rapture will happen in the morning time. I don't know about that, but where will he find you? Will he find you here in the Word of God, whether you're in a seat or got the phone in your hand? Will he find you still engaged with his Word? Or will he find you disengaged because of your life? What's he going to find? And here's the thing. Even though they didn't believe David, maybe for a few minutes, and even though they wanted to stone him, kill him, God didn't just restore the one who cried out to him. He restored the one, all the ones that were with the one who cried out. Maybe nobody else in your house wants to cry out to God no more. Maybe your spouse don't care no more. Let's just be honest. Maybe they don't want to shout like you. Maybe they don't want to praise like you. Maybe they don't want to intercede and fast and, 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 and digest the word of God like you. Guess what? God is going to bring some blessings to their life and some breakthroughs to their life, not because of what they did, but because of what you did on their behalf. And then it's going to catch them up, and they're going to say, oh, my God, if my wife can pray this up on me, if my husband can pray this up on me, how about I start praying? What will happen then if we both are praying? Good God am I? I'm tired of seeing Christian marriages where only one spouse is going to God. Time for them both to go to God and be power, be a powerhouse couple. When I say that Tim and Gladys Hall are a powerhouse couple, I don't say that to, 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 to make them feel good. I say that because they both love God. They both are on fire for God. They both seek God. And it shows. It shows when you've been with the Lord. Come on, somebody. Guess why? Guess why those guys followed David immediately into the enemy's camp? Because they could visibly see David has just been with God that fast. 
sometimes it might take an all night prayer. Sometimes it might take several hours. But some, God knows when an emergency is coming. God, I need your presence right now. They got rocks in their hand, they're done. They want to kill me. God said, whew, I better pour some glory out on that young man right now. Right? And guess what? They benefited. I'm going to wrap it up. When they went after the Amalekites, the Bible says, they didn't know who they were looking for. They might have had fresh tracks. You know, like the cowboys do. Marshall Dillon. He'll find some tracks and he'll just... They had tracks, right? But God left a servant of one of them because he got bad off and they didn't care nothing about him. They left him there to die. He works all things out for your good because you love him. That servant bowed down to David and said, I will tell you exactly who it is. It's the Amalekites. They, and I'm an Amalekite. They let me go and blah, blah, blah. He said, but if you will spare my life, I'll serve you for the rest of my days. David said, don't nobody touch him. Leave him alone. But then half the men, Brother Chris, come up and said, we're tired. Guess what David did? He understood. He said, if you're tired then, you stay here and watch the stuff. We need, he said, we're going to learn from our mistakes. What do you mean? We left Ziglag. We didn't leave a single man there to watch nothing. We left women and children there by themselves, vulnerable. That's another sermon. We're going to leave these men here. We're not going to judge them. We're not going to hate on them. They're going to share in the spoils too. So he took the 300 who will help me, and he went in there, and he whooped every Amalekite in there, took back everything, the wives, the children, and all their stuff, all their belongings. And they went and put it back with the stuff with the other men who were being protected. They went back home, and they rebuilt Ziglag. God set all that up for them because he is a rewarder of those who will diligently seek him. He is a restorer of all the years and all the seasons that the locust and the canker worm have devoured from you. Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Don't stop trusting. You shall recover all. When you know who validates you. Did anybody get anything out of this first message? Do you think it's going to be okay series? Do you want to learn a little bit more about this thing called validation? Then you come back Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Until then, stand to your feet. Father, we just praise you this morning. We thank you. We adore you. And we need you, God. Hey everybody, Pastor Daniel Parker here with Assistant Pastor Tim Hall thanking you for tuning in this week and watching this live stream broadcast, or if you're watching it recorded later on, we thank you. We want you to share it with everybody that you can. Hit like. Tell us something in the comments if we're reaching you. And if you're in driving distance, we would love to have you right here at Christian Fellowship Church on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Come early for coffee and fellowship, and then we're going to have some of the best praise and worship music you'll hear anywhere and series preaching straight from the Word of God. And then on Wednesday nights, we have our weekly Bible study at 7 p.m., and we got all kinds of things going on Sunday evenings, life groups, men's and ladies fellowship, as well as our all-new Kingdom Couples Marriage Ministry. We love you. We want you to, to sow into the church, be a part of the church. Come on. We love you. If you got saved today, you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, then we want you to message us right here on our page, and we will call and pray for you. Again, thank you for tuning in today. Pastor Tim, what say you to the wonderful people out there that's tuned in today? We pray if this message has reached you, because we're all about kingdom vision. Amen. Come see us. When you, we got to seek just for you. We love you. We thank you. And just continue to keep your faith in God's unchanging hand. And we enjoyed you. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless.